Last year, details came to light about a herpes vaccine clinical trial that was conducted by a faculty member at Southern Illinois University without approval from an IRB or formal consent from participants. William Halford allegedly injected volunteers with a live attenuated herpes simplex virus vaccine in an off-campus hotel and on the island of St. Kitts. The trial has been vigorously defended by supporters who believe that there should be fewer barriers between patients and new treatments. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Bernard Lowe, President of the Greenwall Foundation. Dr. Lowe has written a perspective article about the lessons this case offers for advocates of evidence-based standards for new therapies. Dr. Lowe, can you give us an overview of what we know about this case and what's still speculation? I'd be glad to. So as you summarize, the allegations are really quite serious. They allege violations of fundamental regulatory, scientific, and ethical standards for clinical trials. The professor allegedly injected a vaccine that he had invented and developed into subjects without approval from the Food and Drug Administration and without review and approval by an institutional review board. Moreover, after injecting some participants off the campus of Southern Illinois University, He then flew 17 participants to the island of St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean for additional injection. There was no formal consent form reviewed and approved by an institutional review board. So failure to get IRB approval, failure to get informed consent, and failure to get FDA approval to try an experimental possible new treatment are regarded as major regulatory, ethical violations. What's been the response from the biomedical research community and from the public about these reports? Well, I think the biomedical researchers, research institutions have really agreed this is a serious violation of standards that have been in place since the 1970s as a response to major research scandals, the Tuskegee study mainly. However, there's a totally different perspective by defenders of this scientist and the study that have a completely opposite view, defending, vigorously defending what happened and the scientist involved. And the perspective suggests that understanding sources of this vigorous defense and the arguments that are being put forth hold lessons for scientists and research institutions who are supporters of these standards and of evidence-based clinical trials. You say in your article that investigations into the trial have been launched by Southern Illinois University, the FDA, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, and that several participants have sued the study's sponsor. So what would be the implications of any wrongdoing that were found given that Halford died last year? Well, in addition to the investigations you mentioned, the Federal Office for Human Research Protections and the FDA are also holding investigations. So the company that now holds the patent on this vaccine has announced that it plans to continue development of this product. It says it will follow FDA regulations in the future. So there may be implications for that company. The university, Southern Illinois University, both in its own investigation and the federal investigation, could face sanctions depending on what those investigations find. You say in your article that the Halford case has triggered calls from some quarters to abolish IRB review altogether and radically redefine consent for clinical trials. What do you think are the chances that we'll see that kind of change to current standards? Well, had you asked that question, had anyone asked that question a decade ago, the response would have been, no, these standards are in place, they've been well articulated, and there was pretty strong agreement that they were needed to prevent really serious abuses. This clinical trial is a window into looking at a very different way of thinking. Free market libertarian groups have vigorously defended the trial and the scientist. And for them, the reasoning they use in defending this trial is an indication of how far they believe the dismantling of the Food and Drug Administration regulation and the IRB system needs to proceed. So in terms of speculating, 
these libertarian free market ideas are clearly on the ascendant, both on the state level and in Congress, in the administrative branch of this administration. So I think there, on a lot of fronts, there is a movement to roll back the powers and the regulations of the FDA. And I think the defense of this trial indicates how far that rollback might proceed if the defenders of this trial had their way. Finally, you talk in your article about strategies that advocates of evidence-based standards can use to gain broader public support. How can individual physicians better respond to the needs of their patients who may feel marginalized and frustrated about the lack of effective treatments for their diseases? Absolutely. I think what is clear is that the defenders of this trial, free market libertarian groups, have really connected to the frustration that many patients feel about the lack of effective treatments, the slow path it takes to go from a new drug to approval. Also, I think perceptions of disrespect by the scientific establishment. I think unless the defenders of evidence-based medicine can show they understand and respond to these concerns, the standards of evidence-based medicine are not going to resonate with the public. What I find ironic is that evidence-based medicine has standards that are really tools to help patients and the doctors make decisions about whether a treatment is going to be appropriate for them. But the standards help patients and doctors sort through whether the evidence of both safety and effectiveness is rigorous or whether it doesn't really come up to the level that most people would want to believe. Thank you, Dr. Lowe.